Good morning, everyone. Um, <coughs> we, the first session is on where are digital books headed. Um, <coughs> I don't think anyone really knows because there's so much happening. There's so much experimentation happening here. But we do have a very interesting panel who will actually be able to take us through and introduce us to four, I would say, crucial and, and fascinating aspects of this area. We have Radhika Menon. By the way, I will ask everyone to introduce themselves. I'm only giving a brief overview. Radhika Menon is, has been associated with children's literature for years in India, and they have just begun their foray into digital books. So that's, um, as we all know, a very interesting area to get into, a uh, uh, burgeoning audience. We have James Brittle, <coughs> who is com who's coming especially from uh, UK for this uh, conference. He is the director of Bukkake uh, and a technology-led publisher of uh, classical transgressive literature. He will explain it all, but he will also be sharing his experiences of the UK market and the coexistence of print and electronic publishing. Then we will have Pratibha Shastri, who has been for years uh, uh, communications professional and is now <coughs> with uh, Genie Books dealing with content and um, actually doing very interesting experiments and, and um, of offering services in digital books. And then finally, we have Mr. Balani speaking. Again, he has over a decade's experience of not trade literature and digital, uh, digital publishing, as I think most people over here are defining, but academic. He's, he is uh, responsible for the sale of um, bundles of journals and that, that experience in the universities. And I think in the last decade, there's been a phenomenal um, you know, increase in these sales and experiences. So in a sense, the panel is not only introducing us to four different aspects of digital technology, and uh, but it's also a sort of a, a feeble, not, not feeble, but a kind of a, uh, tracks the evolutionary growth of how from um, how we can from the nascent stage, let's say, what Thirika is exper experimenting with, to, uh, to what academic journals have achieved. And they have been doing it for years. There, that level of, um, of monitoring and, and getting to the consumer, and also fine-tuning their tastes, and creating content in order, in, by mapping the customer's demands is what academic journals have achieved. Anyway, to the first pan uh, uh, panelist, Radhika. Um, I think Radhika, you've got PowerPoint here. Can you hear me? Uh, hi, I'm Radhika Menon, uh, Tulika Publishers, uh, Chennai. Uh, we are children's book publishers, 15 years old now. <coughs> we publish books in nine different languages uh, for the age group of 3 to 16. And uh, we do books in English, Hindi, Tamil, Malayalam, Telugu, Kannada, Marathi, Gujarati, and Bangla. And um, uh, mainly picture books and fiction, non-fiction, and resource books. Uh, when uh, Leonard uh, got in touch, wanted me to be part of this panel. I was very <coughs> hesitant. In fact, I said, "No, I, I don't. I'm not qualified. I really don't know enough, and um, not even sure about it. You know whether we should get into it because uh, because we were not sure, and uh, and not convinced, shall we say? Meaning, how to take it forward? Not like experience with books." But uh, he said, precisely because of that, you uh, should speak. So which is what I'm speaking about. And because of the nature of our publishing, which is children's books, and children uh, being uh, so uh, part of this whole um, digital um, medium in one sense, users of the, of the space, um, it, we, we can't ignore it, that's for sure. And I must say, uh, I must now thank you, not because it has been a learning experience for me just putting this together, you know, think about it in a focused manner and uh, see what has been the experience and where we're going. So 
So I stopped with the with the uh, first part of the of the topic itself, where digital books are headed. Digital books itself, you know, raised a question mark, and there are many questions, and uh, including where uh, digital books are headed, and many questions follow. Uh, so I'll read the first. The question publishers asking, of course, uh, what is the ideal content for children's books? What is the best technology to support it? How do we negotiate digital rights? How do we make money from it? And many more. Then questions writers and illustrators are asking. Should we give re digital right of our books to publishers? Should we hold on to the digital rights? If we hold on to it, what do we do with it? How do we make money from them? And booksellers, how do we sell with digital books? Would we make enough money selling them? Should we become an online store entirely? What happens to printed books? So many questions. The question does have an unambiguous answer for children's publishers, in my view, and that is to iPhones and iPads. And why? Because they are perfectly designed for children to handle. The multi-touch user interface is so easy, attractive, and intuitive that children take to it almost naturally. Anyone, in fact, if you see children handling anything with uh, buttons, you can, you can see how naturally they take, take to it, meaning that whatever the remote. And uh, the iPad is kind of the ultimate in that, and uh, they really seem hardwired into that technology. So what then is the problem when we have such a perfect design, de um, device? Digital content is almost entirely market driven. Kate Wilson of Nosy Pro, a leading children's books and app publisher, you may have heard of her, has this to say, the process of developing apps is as much about developing a marketing strat strategy as it is about the production of the app itself. Some significant factors about the market for digital products for children. The iPhone and iPad dominate the market for devices for children's books, e-books, apps, and games because the design is perfectly suited for children. And it is more and more people are getting it. It was an incredibly uh, crowded market. And those in the app business are media, animation, gaming, and toy companies. The iPad has a stamp of approval of parents. Apart from the convenience of having an electronic babysitter, they seem to prefer it over children watching TV, which they see as a mindless activity, whereas uh, mostly. And uh, they consider the iPad and uh, iPhone uh, educational. The interactivity built into apps and even into straightforward e-books is therefore focused on learning skills, since that's what the market demands. To sum up, the iPhones and iPads are irresistible to children who use them, to parents who buy them, and to content providers who see a great opportunity. Both as a creative uh, opportunity as well as a business opportunity. So what is the catch? You can buy products for the iPhone and iPad only in one store in the entire World Wide Web, which can, you can access anywhere in the world. The App Store for um, I operating system uh, online applications. Tulika has three products in the App Store developed by companies who came to us and with whom we were happy to work. One is a book, Who Will Rule, which is an iPhone app. And this is two, three years back, so you know, just when it was beginning. So people saw an opportunity, saw our content, and came to us. And you know, it was a partnership and a revenue sharing one, so we went along, not knowing where this was going to take us. Eki Doki, very, one of our most popular books, illustrated e-book for the iPad in English and Hindi with audio in both languages. Runaway Peppercorn, illustrated e-book for the iPad in English and Tamil with audio in both languages. So these are the three books <coughs> that should be there in the App Store because they have been made into uh, an app and two ebooks. Now, the marketing process <coughs> that follows is the app developer, and you know, nothing has happened, not much revenues have come in, and we really haven't followed it up. It was an experiment, and we left it at that. So, before this presentation, I could then ask questions and uh, 
uh, the person who handles our social media, and she did some uh, browsing and came up with this. Uh, the app developer sends the app ebook to the app store along with the product description and category. The app store screens the app to see if it requires any changes and to make it conform to their policies. For instance, they don't sell porn. Then the app is put up for sale. If the app store thinks it will sell well, they put it under a new and noteworthy section in order to highlight it. And they get a share of the revenue um, each time an app is sold. Customers tend to buy new products which are sold here. They also tend to download content that are all, they are already familiar with. Example, a Dr. Soy's app. Dr. Soy brings it a classic book. I mean, everyone would pick on that if that is there. If the app really sells well, then the product move may be featured in the What's Hot section that boosts sales further. So what we learned is if you don't make it to either of these lists, the chances are that your app will sink. It is difficult for an app to sustain its rank or climb higher as the days go by as new apps keep flooding the market. When Who Will Rule was made a free app, for a while, that's one of the strategies in I2 um, in the I store, which is you can uh, you make it a free app, and it was down. It was number five on the list, which is pretty good, I was told, because you talk about hundreds of apps um, from Western publishers mainly. So if it made it to the fifth, it's pretty good, and it had some good reviews. That's the other thing users review them uh, there itself, and. Um, but when it was made a paid app, app, it sank to the bottom. Now why? Because it was not in the new and noteworthy section. It doesn't automatically get there. There's no, the, I, uh, the store itself decides what goes there. And um, it was not considered new and noteworthy by the app store, but it was obviously highly rated by customers sampling free products. So we don't know what happened, but it is not there. To sum up, an iPhone or iPad is the best di di digital device for children uh, for, for and digital content, but it can be bought and downloaded only in from the App Store. The storekeepers decide what will sell and what won't and showcase the app accordingly. What is on their new and noteworthy uh, list sells best. Best sellers move into the What's Hot section and remaining products disappear. And more and more get added on top. What apps in, uh, where apps and digital books are concerned, uh, clearly technology dominates the market and the market dictates the content. So to me, this is seems a process. Two devices dominate the market. Strongest feature is their multi-touch user interface, which are ideally suited for children. Therefore, you make content for children. Whereas in the print media, in my understanding, there is the, there was the written book. Um, printing technology facilitated production of uh, the book, and content of the book, independent of technology, continues to grow. Of course, there are market considerations, and that's like any product. But but uh, when you look at it uh, on the whole, the big picture is this: as a children's publisher from India, publishing in several languages, the digital market poses serious problems. The best digital content for kids is on the iPhone and iPad, but it is inaccessible to 99.5%. This is my own um, figure, um, because I just couldn't get a figure, but I think 995 probably even more. Of the children in India, it's largely irrelevant to us in India. Even if we turn to other platforms, connectivity and accessibility to computers is a big problem. Even the uh, uh, you know middle level schools, and I'm not talking about the mm, the uh, expensive schools. Um, they at least three to four children to a computer, so it's not as if each child has access to a computer. And this, I'm talking again about a minority, giving the majority out. More that technology is inaccessible to the majority of children all over India. Most of the technology for digital content creation is tailored for the English language and the Roman script. Even Japanese, which Apple claims to support, apparently has serious text handling problems. The economics of digital content creation is based on the English-speaking markets across the world. And I came across this, which I thought was very interesting. According to an online report, the biggest Italian publisher said they sold 2,000 uh, children's apps a month. 
whereupon an American app maker tweeted that they get those numbers per day. So that's the kind of difference. And you need, you need those kind of numbers to make it work. The picture that emerges is one that is heavily loaded, loaded against any kind of diversity, whether in language, culture, technology, or the market. But a whole medium and its vast potential can't be dismissed on the basis, I accept. Perhaps the key to dealing with this, kind of, uh, with this is to find the answer to the question, what is a digital book? It is important for children's publishers like us, for whom the content of the book books um, is primary to understand this. Every stage of the publishing process, the writing, illustrating, translating, editing, and designing is seen in the larger context of creating a nourishing reading and learning environment for the child. The reading experience is much more than just acquiring reading skills, whether from a printed page, a TV screen, or computer screen. Books nourish the imagination. They give children tools to enable them to think about the world around them and how to deal with what lies ahead. Digital technology also offers some remarkable tools for enhancing the reading and learning experience of the child. It is undoubtedly an empowering tool for the child. Other long-term advantages and drawbacks will emerge with time. The problem arises when marketing considerations have to be embedded into the content. What are these marketing considerations? An app or enhanced ebook for children has to be entertaining and attention grabbing. The teaching learning element has to be strong for a children's app to work. The main buyers are parents and they have to be convinced about the usefulness of the app. Apps are seen to be about instant learning in a way that books are not. It really goes against everything, uh, at least in, in the publishing process in ours. We, we resist that because just looking at the book, reading the book, or hearing it read aloud, looking at the pictures, is the learning experience you're talking about. And different children get different things out of it. That's the given. But here, what you're saying has to be you know, higher. In fact, if you look at the reviews of uh, apps and e-books online, uh, the ratings are about um, one of the key things is educational value. In a way, you won't find in books find uh, review ratings uh, for uh, educational value. To me, that's a worrying thing. One of the most highly rated apps today is based on Dr. Soy's books. Ocean, Ocean House Media, who have made waves as a creator of the Dr. Soy's books apps, has this to say about the books. They have been written to teach children to read. And that really made me sit up, because there's much more about those books than just teaching to read. So everything else becomes second. The, the perception itself, they pick books to see what you can read, uh, your children can learn from them, and therefore sell more. Childlike cute illustrations are favored because it is said that in the app store, if you have to stand out, then it has to be childlike and cute. Anything more will you know, just confuse the buyer. A book that we publish is a finished product in which all the elements, how a story is told, the Im imagery, the design and layout come together to make a whole. Weakening of any of these elements affects the books and what it conveys. Will adapting a book for the digital medium weaken the integrity of the, integrity of the book or will it transform it into something quite different, a, different, a totally new genre? Using, popping, bobbing, growing, moving pictures for their own sake, sake is pointless. And reading exercises with virtual rewards for reading and spelling it at touches are fine as they go. But just clickability isn't enough. Techniques have to be used with some purpose. They must contribute to the whole. Books, by their very nature, are interactive. But it is the interactivity that feeds the imagination that is truly valuable. Yet publishers say what is happening to books in the digital world is invigorating. About, and I found this amusing because I think it's true, about the digital revolution in the children's space, I feel a bit like Paul on the road to Damascus, knocked abruptly from my mule, I rise a sudden, passionate, all-consumed e possum says Chip Gibson, president of Random House. While we're not ourselves such committed converts, it is clear that the digital space for children can't be ignored. It is a space children are inhibiting more and more. Uh, 
An overriding concern is with the quality of the product being offered to children, whether in the form of printed books, e-books, or apps, and with children's engagement with texts and visuals in any medium. Tulika has been dealing with the challenges of publishing and marketing since 19, multilingual books since 1998, uh, 1996. There have been many firsts and breakthroughs. The challenges before us are, can the digital products made from our books expand the space our books are created, not just in India, but internationally? <clears throat> can the multilingual content of our books be used to bridge the digital divides to some extent? The advice to publishers from people who have made a success of digital content for children is unlearn what you have learned. On the contrary, as publishers who have been deeply engaged with children's content, we have to build on what we have learned, and that I'm convinced about. We have three collaborative partnerships to develop digital content for our books. All three offer platforms that are not restricted to the I operating system. Story Truck, um, this is a, anyway, this is the um, book, Olubuti Tolubuti, uh, which, rhyme, which has rhymes from 18 languages translated into English and in the original. It has a digit, it will have a digital ed edition on the site where you can listen to the rhyme and baby olu, baby tolu, baby kosu too. The seed in this hand is now in that. Baby olu, baby tolu, baby kosu too. The seed in that hand Mekuri Hikaroloi Jai. The cat goes prowling that house to this. It eats up the soaked rice and all the fish. Chiri chiri raining, Elish fish are dancing. A black storm is coming and many trees are falling. Chiri chiri prishti pare nache ilish maach. Kalpui shakhi chhar uti chhe bhaanche kaktu gaach. Butterfly, butterfly, friend of little flowers, where do you go when the evening lamps glow? Prajapati, prajapati, chottu phule shathi, kothai tumi ure jau, jale shundha bati? That's just two pages from the book and I mean, we were really excited by the, they, uh, the story truck contacted us wanting our books just to be read aloud on how we can do this so you can download the whole book for a price um, and uh, listen to the, you know, it's a big book, it's okay, 84 pages, 54 rhymes in English and the language in 18 rhymes. So it is truly multilingual, the experience, because you can listen to each of those languages in the original if you want to, and there is the English translation which opens it to everybody. So Story Truck is a social platform where you can read, record, and share stories from books online. You can store the books online and share it through email, Facebook, and Twitter. You can even have a playlist of recorded books that children can listen to anytime. The technology is ideal for multilingual books, as books in any language can be uploaded, read out, and recorded. Um, my our experience with the uh, iPad again, where uh, you know, uh, I was really excited because they said all languages we can have all eight languages um, and the English, and you just have to flip, and you can listen to the different languages. But it turned out that we had to do it English, Tamil, English, Hindi separately because it was too heavy. You can't just have English and have any button and go to any language. So it is tedious, you don't really, meaning it, it's, it's that much more tedious. Whereas in a site like this, I mean, it's just recorded and, you know, it, to me the whole process is much more accessible and simple and it's on a website, so you can download it anywhere, anytime. Uh, the next one is uh, Mimi Tales. MimiTales.com is a site which has its own app the Mimi Tales Reader, which can be do downloaded on any device, smartphone, tablet, or computer. That gives you access to the enhanced ebooks and apps on their site. 
That suits Tulika as multilingual digital content can be downloaded to any device. It also gives us the advantage of having the iPhone iPad option, which opens up the US market for the products. And the products are put on their website. And if you want to buy the i version, you go to the iTunes store. So these are the five books that um, is there uh, on, the, on the site. The process has just begun. Slate is a content development software designed by experts in, in education and publishing. Um, a long time friend and designer who, who had worked with us earlier has come up with this. The software can be used to develop digital content for mainstream and special schools. It can be used by students of all abilities to augment K-12 lessons in schools, by children learning a new language or building on an existing language, and by those with speech-related difficulties. Slate supports the development of multilingual content with audio and video. Again, it's a website. Uh, it is a software, and uh, which if you download, and, uh, it's already being used in uh, by schools in Tamil Nadu and uh, other places. Yeah. So, as a multilingual publisher, we have got where we have by creating a space for our books in nine regional uh, language children's book markets. So it's not like dealing with one Indian market. It's really dealing with the Marathi, the Bangla, and Gujarati, and so on. We have invested time and effort and formed collaborative partnerships to develop the market. We see the need for a similar approach in marketing digital products derived from our books. Children today are growing up in a cultural space that is wired, connected, and interactive all at once. The question is whether the richly textured reading experience offered by books can take its place alongside the interactive digital experience of the child and whether each can enhance and strengthen each other. Perhaps printed, book, printed books and digital content based on books are not so different after all. So we come a full circle to the question we started with, what are digital books? A new art form, a new genre, a new container for an old genre. And back to the platypus question, is it a mammal, a bird, or a fish? bit about um, ebooks in, in various ways, um, in, in the way that they've sort of been coming about in, in the UK, where I'm from, and in the US. Um, some of the stuff I'll talk about has kind of already happened, uh, some of it is happening right now, and some of it is, I'm pretty sure, going to happen, even if it sounds um, quite far-fetched. Um, I'm a publisher myself, I've been a publisher for years, um, I still publish things occasionally. These days I tend to publish um, in a smaller way, in a more experimental way. I start small imprints to try out new, new types of technology, uh, new publishing technologies, new distribution and marketing technologies. Um, so I'll, I'll publish books because I love them, but also because I want to kind of explore the ways they're now coming out into the market and that readers are interacting with them. Um, it's mostly fiction. Um, it's, it's adult fiction, it's mostly literary fiction. Um, I think it has a lot of applications across things, but there's obviously huge differences. I think there's huge differences in children's books, which is not an area I'm very familiar with. Differences in academic books. Mostly I'm concerned with long form text, um, but I'll speak to some other areas as well. Um, I've been doing this for a while, and it's always really interesting to see how it changed. Um, kind of five years ago, you went to any publisher in the UK or the US, and you asked them about ebooks, and their response was basically to stick their fingers in their ears and go, no, 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 it's never going to happen. 
Um, so it's very interesting to see how that now is, has almost completely changed. Um, every publisher now has uh, an ebook division of some kind, or how they have digital publishers, uh, they're driving ahead, and they're surprising themselves um, with the growth of the, of the ebook market. And, and it, it, even though some people have been saying this is coming for years, it seems to have sort of taken everyone by surprise, and I think that's in large part because there's a lot of strange or uh, simply wrong expectations about what digital books involve. Um, the, the largest misconception of them is, or one of the major misconceptions of them is that they're just for young people and the older people aren't interested in them. Um, I was saying to someone at breakfast this morning, um, I often start presentations like this with a picture of my dad. Because um, I, I used to go to a lot of conferences and stand up and talk about digital books and everyone would say, that's great, but you're, you're a young person, you know, it's, it's all right for you, but it's not for the rest of us. My dad's 65, he reads mostly military history. Uh, he reads it now almost entirely on the Kindle. Uh, he absolutely loves it. He's a complete convert. Um, it's a perfect device for him uh, because he can take the books wherever he goes uh, very easily because uh, he likes big, heavy books and they're no longer big and heavy. And increasingly, he can increase the text size and so many other things that make, make reading yeah, easier. So um, th there's a whole kind of way, and I'll, I'll come on to the other things about that as well, but just about how, um, how we've have entered the market as well. I think it's important to see why suddenly there's this huge growth in them in, in the UK and the US, and why that will slowly extend everywhere else as well. And it's not uniform either. Certainly within Europe, there's, there's huge differences in different countries. And a lot of that is language-based, as, as different languages slowly come, come online, essentially, with e-books. Um, but the major drive for it is e-commerce. Um, it's, it's been true up to now that you really can't have e-books without some kind of e-commerce set up, because that's how the books are sold, that's how people get, get to them. You, know, you don't go into a shop to buy an e-book, you have to buy it online. And it's taken kind of 10 years for Amazon in particular to gain a, a really strong foothold. Um, but the reasons Amazon did are the same reasons I've been hearing from people here about things like Flipkart. Um, it's very, it's a good, simple service. It's very reliable. All these, when I first heard about Flipkart, I think it was three or four years ago, um, I heard about it uh, from publishers in India, and a couple of them had heard of it, and a couple of them hadn't, um, and, uh, and, and, the, and none of them were, didn't think it was going to take off at all. A couple of years ago, everyone seemed to have heard of it, no one was yet using it. Now almost everyone I've spoken to is using it. Um, actually, I'd be really interested to know if, if people could pull out their hands to use Flipkart. Or a similar, right, I, I, right. Can you imagine me asking that question two years ago? Would, would anyone, I mean, so this is the thing, we don't necessarily notice these changes happening, but actually they happen incredibly fast when they do. And that is a pre absolute solid precursor to ebooks happening. The other things that e uh, precursor to ebooks really take you off well, not taking off, but becoming a core cool part of our business is that the businesses themselves change. Um, so the organisations restructure themselves around ebooks, and I, I've seen this happen in various different ways. It was weird the way it happened in the UK. Um, it always seemed to get stuck under audiobooks, which is a very large market, um, and always had a kind of dedicated team within a publisher. And because those guys were the tech guys essentially, uh, they got stuck with ebooks. And that continued for quite a few years before people realized that ebooks were actually very much like physical books. They required a lot of the same stages of production. Uh, they required a lot of the same marketing techniques. Uh, and and ebooks have slowly come into the organization and become much more a core part. But it's taken five years of quite serious restructuring and a real re-understanding of the publishing process on the part of publishers. Um, to, to bring ebooks into the core. And it's only when those two things, the distribution network and the e-commerce, and the changes that happen within, a, within publishing, the publishing industry and individual publishing companies, that you really see this growth of ebooks start to happen. Um, I, I think Michael was gonna to speak to that a bit as well, so I hope he's around later, because I, mean, I know he will talk more about this, about the way that publishers now have digital as, as an absolute part of their workflow. Uh, it's, it's, they sit between the uh, editors and the distribution in just the way the physical book production does. Um, and I think it's, and it's the most important lesson to be learned from some of the US and UK experience of digital is, uh, is, not to, is, is not to see digital as something of lesser quality. It's a huge mistake lots of publishers made, essentially because they didn't want to be doing ebooks, because they didn't like them. Uh, they treated them as cheap, rubbish objects. Um, they, 
publishers have spent hundreds of years getting really good at making beautiful, well-made books, and then e-books came along and we threw that all away. And we started producing these totally awful books with no sense of typography, no, no eye for detail and design, none of the skills that readers actually really appreciate and that we're really good at. But because we didn't really want e-books to happen, we just ignored those things. And e-books come out, still come out, horribly typeset, badly proof, lots of spelling mistakes, all kinds of errors in them. And, and, and the really terrible result of this is uh, customers don't think, already think that e-books should cost less, and when they see them badly produced like that, then they think they should cost even less. And we've damaged ourselves hugely, and I think it's going to have terrible repercussions for it. Um, because we, we ourselves have devalued these books. So it's really important to remember that e-books have just as much value as books. Just as much care and attention should go into them, as, as has gone into the writing of them. Um, the, the other thing that e-books change radically, the digital changes, is, is the kind of power balance within the industry. Um, now, booksellers and distributors have always had a huge amount of power within the industry, um, but there's always been a, a certain kind of respect, um, what we might have once called a gentleman's agreement, uh, between these kind of different areas of publishing. Um, that, that's gone entirely. It's, it's particularly gone through the rise of the big uh, joint distributors and booksellers like Amazon. Um, Amazon has been slowly eating its way both ways up the distribution chain in the US and UK for, for several years now. You know, they, they now actually print books, they publish them, uh, they distribute and sell them. With this comes a, a huge amount of power, and also with it comes a huge amount of knowledge. Uh, it's really interesting to see kind of what Amazon knows. Um, publishers traditionally have, have not had much idea about uh, what readers, are, who's actually buying their books, who's reading them. We got some kind of data from bookshops. Uh, we now get pretty much nothing from Amazon. Uh, Amazon really aren't interested in sharing that information. Um, uh, but you can see in places where, where they're starting to gain it. One of the really interesting things about ebooks in particular is that they provide this kind of window into the reading process. Um, I've always thought it's strange that um, public, as publishers we know so little about when people are actually reading, because that's where the magic happens, right? But we do all this work to, to talk about the books and to get them into bookshops and convince people to buy them. And then there's this kind of silent period where people go away and they read them and we know nothing about that. And then afterwards we may get to discuss it and all that stuff. And that's fantastic and, and, and it's all we could have done. But now we have this kind of window into the process itself. Amazon, through the Kindle, knows how people are reading. And, and you can see this starting to have an effect. It has an effect in the way they're recommending books to people. Recommendation's really hard. It's why we value bookshops, where we go in and someone actually says, oh, you like this, well, you like this. And because they're a human being, they actually give us a recommendation we like. Um, uh, computer systems are very bad at that. It's very hard. Uh, Amazon's starting to improve that because they're seeing how people read. And they're also changing the format of books themselves. This gets really interesting, I think. Um, so Amazon launched, um, well, Amazon noticed that a lot of people simply weren't finishing books. Um, I think we've all secretly known this for a while, but no one likes to say it. Um, it's something we have huge kind of human guilt about, about not finishing books. Amazon are, are a big machine, essentially, so they don't have that worry. They saw that people were, weren't finishing books, so they were like, well, we do shorter books. So they launched this whole range called Amazon Singles, Kindle Singles, which is a whole imprint, or a whole, it's almost a whole new genre dedicated to shorter long-form fictions, 10,000 10, words, what would be a kind of a 50-page book, maybe. Um, and, and this is a format that's kind of, that's very hard to do in paper books but it's absolutely perfect for electronic reading. And it's driven by the way people are actually reading that you can see because they're doing it electronically and it's kind of reported on. Um, so Amazon through being in this, and when I say Amazon, I kind of mean anyone who takes up this middleman position in digital, and that could be publishers as well, has this far greater understanding of both uh, the business, of the selling of books, and of the reading books than we kind of ever had before. And that could be incredibly beneficial to publishers. Um, if, if we're kind of smart about it. It's also a, a huge danger because it gives them all this power. Um, in the UK, Amazon has a, a, a huge amount of control over the market and it's growing all the time with electronic books. In the US, something slightly more interesting happened, um, which is that publishers saw that Amazon were getting this huge amount of control. So they introduced agency publishing. They introduced this, they, they, they brought back control to themselves over the pricing of the books. 
Um, this was in fact semi-legal, um, as in semi-illegal, as in no one's quite sure if they were really allowed to do that. But while they argued over it about six months, it gave Barnes & Noble, the biggest uh, book, uh, bricks and mortar retailer in the US, time to get their own competitor to the Kindle app, the Nook. And that was a very deliberate action on the part of publishers to ensure that one ebook company didn't take complete control of the market. And it was successful. The Nook is a serious competitor to Amazon in the US. It's a far healthier ebook market. And one, another thing to really keep an eye on is making sure that there are these different ways of obtaining ebooks. Because otherwise, we're all at the mercy of the single largest ebook retailer, um, which is not good for publishers and it's not good for books. We know this stuff. Um, so finally, I'll, I'll talk very briefly about um, the way I kind of see ebooks going and some of the reasons I think they've happened in the ways they have. I think it's very key that one of the things that's only started happening with ebooks just as they've become popular is they've also become a lot more sophisticated. And by this, I don't necessarily mean uh, additional media. Um, I actually worked for a couple of years on, a, on a, what we call an enhanced ebook reader for the iPhone. We, we, we took publishers' books and we enhanced them with video and audio content and um, reading of the text and interviews with the authors. And it was great, but it wasn't hugely successful, and, and rightly so, I think, because I don't think it added anything in particular. Um, it's very tempting when new media come along to kind of mush them together any way you want, say, oh, well, if there's more video and audio, that's definitely better. And in some contexts, probably in children's and academic and education, that, that, that there's obviously a case for that. Uh, but in, in my area in fiction, um, writing should be enough. Um, there's just new technologies for their own sake don't necessarily <laughs> enhance the writing. But what the things that have enhanced ebooks is the increasing sophistication of the software itself. And in particular, what I mean by this is the type of interactions that readers have with their books. One of the things that I always thought was missing in people's um, fear of ebooks. But when people talked about how they didn't want ebooks to come, they always talked about the feel of the paper and the smell of the book. No one talked about the smell of the book until ebooks came along. It's a slightly odd thing, people see the session. Well, they talk about reading in bed or in the bar, these kind of strange obsessions. They're all true, but actually you can do them with all the ebooks. My feeling is that what people were actually getting at was, was fearing of losing other affordances of the book, which are the sense of ownership you have over it, um, that it belongs to you, the ability to do things like dog ear it, underlying passages, to mark it up, to, to make it your own in a much more fundamental way. And what we're seeing now with ebooks is those things becoming available as well, the ability to highlight, to be able to bookmark properly, um, to organize them in the way that we understand ebooks should be. And, and what we're starting to call this emerging field is, is something called social reading. And it's, it's where people can share their bookmarks and, uh, and their, their notes and highlights and this kind of stuff. And they don't have to be social. Um, like you, but making them social also allows people to save them for themselves. And this is very important as well. Um, because these books should belong to the readers. When you buy a book, a book or an e-book, it should in some way belong to you. Um, so we see increasingly that the, uh, the experience of reading is, is almost separate from the book itself. That the book, the e-book, has become slightly invisible. Um, as long as you have access to the text, uh, that's, that's brilliant, but what's important is that you retain your own sense of the book through your bookmarks, through your highlights and your notes. And that also has amazing possibilities in other areas as well. The fact that a teacher can mark up a book, send those notes to all of their students who can import them into their own copy of the text. Those are the sort of things that we're starting to build into ebooks now and that are really exciting. Um, so it's incredibly important that we, we keep so several of these things, that the quality of the text themselves, um, that we keep an open market for ebooks and digital, that we are all invested and involved in it. Um, and I thought it was really interesting hearing about, in, in children's publishing, the, this idea that the, uh, the device kind of decides the content, because it's very true. Um, and as we've heard, that's also not a good thing. So it's incredibly important that publishers are interested and involved in this market so that we can help shape it as well because we have so much experience of this that it's absolutely up to us to define what the, the digital book is and what it looks like. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, 
I'm, uh, I'm with Genie Books. I'm quite new to this couple of months old for this e-book and all. Sometime back, I was running a film magazine on the South Indian film industry, print magazine. And, uh, you know, any time I would lay out the, uh, I mean, when I'm sitting with the designer to lay out the photograph, I'm like, okay, there are 10 photographs. But I could, because of the limitations of the print, I could only put in maybe, say, uh, three photographs or four photographs. And I would keep wondering, wish there was a way, you know, wherein I could put a couple more pictures. Of course, I would have had to increase the number of pages, but then there were not so many advertisers, so I could not increase. But then the most I could do was, you know, maybe put in a CD along with the magazine, or maybe, you know, add in the audio CD along with the magazine so that they could listen to the songs. And I kept wondering, wish there was something. Yes, of course, online was always there. But somewhere, you know, while I'm reading the magazine, I could just click and go there and know more about it. And uh, that's when I got to know about Genie Books. It's a bookstore on iPad that we have. It's an app on iPad. And uh, when they said, come join us, this is what it can do. I didn't know more about uh, the app or how it works. Of course, on mobile, I used to download a couple of wallpapers or something, but I didn't know more about it. But then uh, I got to know about Jane Books, and I'm part of it and now. Uh, like I said, it's an app on iPad. And here, what we do is we just don't you know, put in the books as they are. We reformat it for the medium that it is. You, know, you can add audio, you can add video over there, and uh, a lot of interesting things that we can do. We started off with comics, and as of now, we have moved on to coffee table books. So we just uh, recently, we are currently working on a mural book. And what one of the criteria that we look for is, you know, the publisher has to be involved. The kind of involvement that they show is something that will be very, very helpful when you're recreating books for this format. That's what we've seen, you know. Maybe they have a lot of photographs that can be added as a photo gallery. Videos that they might have shot for whatever reason or audios that can be incorporated here. You know, these are the innovations that this medium offers. Just imagine a children's book and uh, the Cinderella story, for instance, and the glass slipper. You can actually create your, you know, the child, whoever is using the iPad or the tablet. So just imagine the child can create her image over there and try on that slipper, maybe. Of course, you can always cheat and make sure you always can, you know, fit into the glass slipper. But these are the innovations that this medium offers. And as far as education goes, there are a lot many apps like Inkling wherein you can share notes with your uh, fellow student or maybe like, you know, James was talking, the teacher can send out the notes to everybody. You know, these are the interesting apps that are there as far as iPad is concerned. So what I would like to tell the publishers is, you know, at least take a chance. As part of this, whenever I've spoken to publishers, I've been like, um, okay, let's see, maybe sometime in the future, but we'll be playing catch up. By then, many other people would have come up with more, better versions. So, you know, here, at least with India, it's not many publishers are willing to give it a try, but I think you should, you know, at least, you know, whenever we are speaking, we say, okay, with, not with all the books, at least try with one book and see. So that you are not, you know, you know, once it works, doesn't work, yes, of course, as of now, the kind of money you can make with it is little less, or the kind of deals that you can crack with the, you know, the iPad, uh, the app owner is maybe revenue sharing, or maybe you know, in terms of uh, set of fees or something. Uh, I should, you know, congratulate you, Tulika, for I mean, you know, uh, Radhika for actually putting it all up over there. You know, you are taking that chance. You are not waiting for, you know, maybe someday when it will be more popular in India to play you know, catch up for it. You're already there. And maybe in a couple of years, you could be the number one, you know, app over there. So you should actually, I would urge publishers to actually try and try with one book at least because there are not many things. Of course, with fiction, it's just reading. But I'm sure there are many coffee table, you know, uh, books or maybe children books, uh, publishers over here. So just try it out with one. Then maybe go in for other books over there. How many of you know of uh, Amanda Hopkins? Okay, she's 26 years old. She's self-published nine e-books, 
on Amazon. Every month she sells 100,000 plus books at $3 each. She gets 70% of it. Now make the math. So it's not just useful for you know the big time publishers, even self publishers. If you feel your content is good enough, just make use of this medium. This is all I'd like to say. Thank you. Uh, as a publisher, to begin with, but then uh, I think I didn't have much patience uh, to really cook something and then eat after months or years. So I slowly switched to distribution of books. Uh, I found that more interesting. Because every evening I could have some money with me. Uh, so I, I deal with about 50 publishers, overseas publishers. We have wholesalers, we have offices in uh, Bangalore, Calcutta, Bombay, Ahmedabad, Delhi, uh, Chennai. Uh, and then uh, we, I got into selling of ebooks and e journals way back in 2000. Uh, that move I did, and uh, lots of publishers that I deal with. So I made a, a paper which I would like to read uh, to give you more insight into ebooks. Uh, so my expertise, whatever little I have, is in the academic market and in higher education. And the question that we have today is where are digital books headed? Uh, the answer is almost everywhere. Uh, we can find ebooks used in used in schools. In India I'm talking about colleges, universities, research institutions. And uh, recently, even at Taiwan International Airport, they have e-books facility for the transit passengers. So that's kind of new markets that are opening up uh, for e-books. Uh, I even find e-books on TV screens and airplanes. When I, tra I travel a lot, and I find that you know uh, people watch movies, but there are also e-books available. You can browse. In fact, if you just look at the table of contents, it's free. You can they even allow you to read few pages which is free and if you like a book then you buy it on the spot through your credit card. So that's a convenience and that makes you know like sales happen you know when you are flying. It's good for publishers what to be content. Uh, so I'm a firm believer of print is dead. However it is not dead as yet. Thankfully we still have time to go digital before it's too late. I started marketing and selling ebooks and e-journals way back in 2000 and have gained from this move. The publishers are undergoing tectonic shift and these shifts are going in one direction and that is being digital. In the past we had handwritten scrolls at the great Alexandria library, now no more scrolls. We had long playing records, now no more. We then had cassettes, we discarded them and we don't use cassettes anymore. We then had CDs, we don't use CDs anymore. Even the new great Bibliotheca Alexandria now has ebooks and digital content. We don't even write letters, even love letters anymore. We use SMSs and emails. We don't even send greeting cards anymore. They're all electronic greeting cards. So we humans like to change and adapt to new technologies very fast. And therefore, there's no reason that we will not embrace ebooks. Publishers now have a new landscape to prepare and prepare for future and be future ready. The rise of ebooks in Indian libraries is like a revolution as the librarians find ebooks easy for archiving and build library collections overnight, uh, allowing simultaneous multiple access to patients, saving on library space, and so on. The customers have choice buying ebooks on subscription model, perpetuity, and on patron-driven access models to optimize use of their budgets. The Ministry of Human Resource Development has given huge budget in providing ebooks to government colleges under endless program under uh, Inflimnet Consortium, where 1,400 colleges having internet access, though they may not have clean drinking water are already enjoying the benefits of ebooks. MHRD's aim is to provide ebooks to around 20,000 government colleges. This initiative has received a lot of appreciation and many awards from different quarters. This is a big opportunity for all kinds of e-publishers. Apart from this, we have hundreds of universities, engineering, medical, law, social science, humanities, 
uh, management institutions who could be buyers and users of ebooks. The features of some of the ebooks platforms uh, could be that one can search thousands of ebooks simultaneously, mark up on ebooks, access anytime, anywhere, view multimedia content like videos and audios and etc. And you can also create your own bookshelf for future use. Facility to machine translate content. Uh, and check usage. Uh, you know, the universities are buying ebooks, they can also use the check the usage whether books are being used or not, or what kind of books are being used so that you spend money on you know, those subject areas. Today we have many ebook uh, reader devices like laptops, Kindle, Sony, Android, uh, Android, iPad, Blackberry, Kobo, and most popular of course cell phones and many more. We are electronically connected and hardly ever offline. This will have an impact on the declining sales of print books in the field of professional reference and even mass paper bags. Therefore, publishers having e-books or digital content will be at an advantage point. Publisher now can offer, can offer and make available their content on different platforms with different digital rights management controls to their advantage, resulting in conducted by Chinese Academy of Press and Publications covered more than 19,000 people from 51 cities in China. It found that 630 million e-books were read by people between the ages of 18 and 70 in 2010. The survey indicates popularity of e-books. It shows that 16.4% of the readers in Chinese language buy paperbacks after reading the electronic versions. So with the advent of e-books, a new business that is print on demand is emerging and bringing in good business for publishers who do not have print stocks anymore. So out of print books can be a huge success if made available as e-books. There are no fixed pricing formulas for e-books as we have in print world. I think publishers have to constantly work uh, or rework on pricing and distribution models where, uh, which were set few years ago and need constant review. Recently, I read that Mr. Josh Marwell, the president and sales of HarperCollins, announced their new policy uh, where ebooks licensed to libraries can only be checked out 26 times, after which uh, time the libraries will need to uh, purchase new licenses. <coughs> uh, in a public letter uh, to libraries, HarperCollins defended the loan restriction, saying it will balance the needs of authors, libraries, and their patrons and publishers. Therefore, each publisher will have to design its own rules of pricing distribution networks to reach different audience and market. Also, publishers will have to constantly invest in upgrading and upgrading their hardware and software, which actually becomes extinct by the time you buy it. There's also a huge potential for Indian language publishers in terms of making their content digital. But do we really know where they are, how to find them, Many of them just publish few books and do not even use ISBNs. So how do we track such publishers? We need to have a separate forum or an association which can bring these publishers together, organize book fairs and workshops to make their content known, translate their content in different Indian and foreign languages. I see huge sales potential in this segment for both print and digital markets. As I said earlier, the publishers are constantly going through disruptions and are seeking answers to many questions which I hope we'll be able to find during these two days of deliberations. I think we all have to be future ready to benefit from the digital world. With this, I conclude my observations on ebooks. Thank you very much. Radhika Menon and Mr. James Bright said 
Uh, I have a few observations and a couple of questions. I understand that uh, Mr. Bright had uh, that very important point about the growing uh, power and concentration in the hands of agencies like Amazon and uh, other e-publishing, e-content uh, making uh, institutions. Radhika Men also talked about how market is actually uh, dictating the content of uh, especially of children's books and such things. I think we need to be extremely wary and we should be extremely aware of, of this, this problem when you talk about uh, e-publishing and technology. Uh, often I feel that we, we are too, uh, too, too enamored of technology and we get carried away because after all the creation and uh, distribution, dissemination of the knowledge, the knowledge content creation and uh, reach to people is very important. Not just the short term from the publishing point of view, but for, for, for society as a whole. So democratizing and making it more accessible to people and allowing various voices to prosper is very important. When we think about e-publishing, we should also be aware of it. There are people who might say that internet has made things very uh, easy to access and people can, uh, can they have an opportunity to publish. But uh, even there, there is a concentration. Sites, only a few sites are accessed. So when we talk about uh, e-publishing, I think we should be, uh, we should also be thinking about this this process of uh, of smaller uh, of voices, voices which are in minority, which do not have an outlet. Are they going to be submerged? Are they going to be to to survive or not? feels in some ways it hasn't changed it very much at all. Um, um, I, it, it's still definitely easy enough to start a small publisher to, to reach a niche, to do all those kind of things. Um, the kind of promised magic land of being able to communicate with everyone hasn't necessarily happened. It's still hard. We still have to do marketing. We still have to do promotion. We still have to do all the things that basically you used to have to do as a niche. But the, the barriers have lowered. The, the other place where it has changed quite a lot is um, it's changing a lot of the kind of recycling of books, which is the wrong word, but what I mean is when a smaller house would republish classics, for example. Um, it's, it's less possible to do that now because everyone's doing that. Um, it's, it's When a book goes out of print, um, it's not really possible to go off and, and sort of buy the rights back as a smaller publisher than that because larger publishers can just buy up the rights to everything because it's so cheap to produce electronically. Um, so again, it, it, it's, it's the same issue really with scriptures, I feel, that we just, we need to make sure that there is this, it, like, this doesn't remove the necessity to kind of insist on a certain diversity to really ensure that, that happens. Um, it, the, the opportunities for it are there, but the challenges are made as well, which is a horrible hedge. I have a question for Pratiba. You just spoke about the success story of the self-published author on Amazon. So can you please elaborate on that? Like, uh, something, some more? Okay, uh, like I said, um, Amanda Hopkins. she's Amanda Hopkins, yeah, uh, she's 26 years old. She just wrote a couple of stories and uh, one is also on one of her friends, in fact. And uh, some interesting e-books that she's written, nine e-books. And uh, like I said, um, she gets 70% of whatever is sold over there, okay. Every month, because of the cheap price, or um, I, okay, let me not say cheap, but you know, the kind of pricing that she has. If it is other books, you know, they're a couple of dollars, like maybe uh, $10, $12, but her books are priced at $3, okay, each. And, uh, you know, because of the self-publishing thing, you get to choose, you know, you get to choose along, you know, uh, how much you can price it at, and then uh, there are no overheads. In, in print, like, there are a lot of overheads, and you just get a royalty, you know, 10%, 12%, depending on what stage you are in as an author. But here, she gets 70% and she's actually refused publishers in you know who have approached her to write books. But uh, yeah, she's making good money out of it, yeah. I'm Maiden from Tara Books, also in Chennai. Uh, I thought it was interesting um, what Radhika was saying about the reach of the iPhone and the iPad in India. I wondered if you thought that there was 
much potential for the development of enabling technologies for reading e-books within India, some that have already developed and perhaps some that are forthcoming, and whether they would have potential to reach greater audiences and even perhaps reach out to marginalised audiences, perhaps have potential to increase literacy, go into schools, and whether digital technology could be used in that way in India. I think so. I think, uh, and, and those kinds of initiatives have been happening over uh, many years. Uh, in fact, I think IIT, uh, Dr. Ashok Jundunwala had this uh, internet kiosks uh, coming up everywhere precisely for this. But one doesn't know why these don't really take off. You know? uh, I think there are uh, far more complex problems involved of the market and so on and the economics involved, similarly a very uh, cheap um, tablet that, or a, was it a mobile phone developed by someone in uh, Bangalore, IIC. Uh, IIC. And uh, so why these technologies don't spread the way it should, why it doesn't get to government support, those are the questions. Slate, for instance, I was the, the software that um, I showed, um, she developed it for um, for uh, children with uh, learning disabilities and uh, special uh, schools and so on. But it is about learning a language at their own pace and uh, works wonderfully. And you know, it's a, it's a very um, accessible software. And uh, so I was pleased when she said she just sold sixty thousand um, copies to the Tamil Nadu government, but turned out that she gave three. So then how does, you know, how, how does uh, a group like that sustain uh, technology like that? So why is it technologies that reaches really, literally millions of um, people, read children, uh, I mean, since we're specifically talking about children, where there is a tangible uh, learning, um, um, uh, learning element to it, I mean, really uh, learning at a very, um, <coughs> Crossing many of the hurdles that um, you know ordinary classrooms and schools have, teachers, so many things. It was really democratic in one sense, uh, the accessibility of quality content. But why hasn't it uh, not taken off? I mean, I, I don't have answers to this, but I think those kinds of initiatives have been going on for a long time. Uh, and doing through digital technology, what can't be done in print? So allowing for for uh, accessibility for persons with disabilities, uh, self-publishing and, and being really successful, uh, and, and all the kinds of things that, that people on this panel are thinking about in terms of uh, using other kinds of multimedia and incorporating them within, uh, within uh, e-books, etc. is very exciting. On the other hand, we have the example of HarperCollins saying that any library will have, can only lend out a book 26 times. If that's something you can't do with a print book, you can't impose such a limitation. You can with a digital book. Okay. So uh, I see that as being backward looking and saying that, that the fungibility of a, of a book uh, is actually a feature that a book is meant to degrade and a book that doesn't degrade naturally, that we should make it degrade and put a 26 time limit on it and, and not allow people to, and then say that after that it's, just gone, that you can't access anymore. So I, I, I'm just trying to think through how you conceptualize what's positive effects of, of digital technology for the publishing market and what the negative effects are. So I have some thoughts on that. I, I Each publisher has different pricing formula. So now in the case of HarperCollins, they think that, okay, after 26 times the book is issued, then you have to re -buy, you know, buy the license again. But this was not the case 10 years ago when they started with ebooks and they went to the market. They had no idea actually in terms of pricing whether the price was good or bad, what could be the formula, whether they give uh, you know complete uh, you know a perpetuity that you buy ebook once and then it's yours. And and over the 10 years now, in fact, things have changed. So there are many publishers. You just buy one book; it remains with you, whether you use it 100 times, million times, it doesn't matter. Even the price remains the same. So the print cost price is say $100 and ebook costs $100. So things have changed over time. So each publisher, as I said in my paper, also has to look at your own you know, workability. 
know, so even in school, uh, universities, even now when they buy print books, for example, as a textbook, they generally buy 30 books at a time, and then after six months, they buy another set of 30, you know, uh, 30 textbooks in different disciplines. So, so that's one thing each publisher has to. I mean, I can't answer on behalf of HarperCollins why they have this policy. I think, mean, you know, maybe uh, Labyrinth is also rethinking because it, it's revenue. How much author is making? You know, if you just give away rights like that, then nobody makes money. So it's, it's an you know, issue which uh, has to be reviewed time and again. You know, there are no set formulas in this e-publishing. Yeah. Yeah, um, I just wanted to give a couple more examples actually because the HarperCollins thing is not the only one. And it's like, we know that's wrong because it's patently ridiculous. Um, they, they, they tried to introduce a similar, I think Faber in the UK also had a proposal that uh, you could download ebooks from libraries, but only if you physically went into the library with your ebook <laughs> reader to have plugged it in. And you, you know why they're doing it, but it, but it doesn't work. And, um, and there, there, there's definitely an issue here because. Well, the, the other thing I quickly want to mention is under the contracts on which most people buy ebooks now, you don't own the ebook. The, the, the agreement to buy is, is actually technically a lease. Um, and most consumers haven't noticed this. And when they do, they're going to be really angry. Um, there, there was a book most people probably heard about when Amazon deleted retrospectively you know, copies of books on people's Kindle. I'm amazed that while there was an outcry, I'm amazed it wasn't worse. Um, like there's a whole bunch of issues there which we haven't really explored yet and could be a real problem. But I, I think the main one to, to this point is that to some extent ebooks break libraries, or at least they break the agreement between publishers and libraries. Because if you can stream ebooks at all times, then do you really need to own books? Um, Amazon last week just started talking about what we know they're going to talk about for ages, which is streaming service for books, where you pay a flat subscription rate for access. There's a whole load of issues here around ebooks that. I, while I, I've always been on the side of people who wanted to own books, um, I own lots, um, I, I actually started to think that that's a very valid model uh, and it's going to be incredibly disruptive uh, because increasingly if you have constant possibility of access, the, necess the necessity of ownership really starts to go away indeed. So that's another thing we need to think about. It's another reason to also be involved in these other areas around book distribution, about publishers controlling the streaming, as well as just the provision, uh, and, and around uh, publishers being involved in conversations around social reading, so they're still involved in the reading process at all times. I would add here, uh, for example, there are some aggregators of e-books, and if you buy books on subscription model, so for example, a university like Delhi, which has you know 50,000 students, and you buy almost 70,000 books, and you just pay maybe $15,000, which is nothing, and you can use these books as many number of times as you like. So there are different models available. So it depends on librarian, again, whether they have one time money to purchase or, or they don't have money and then they use uh, subscription models. My name is Kiruba and I find this huge credibility and prestige difference between e-books and, and the real printed books. When someone authors an e-book, some of that author, that respect isn't there. But the minute you put it in real books, suddenly you're an author and you can have book launches and, and you know, so I find that, you know, I'm a, for 16 years I've been, I'm an online person. And a guy like me who completely believes in the online medium, I'm forced to go on, go to a printer, get a book published, just so that some people look at me, you know, with any right. respect. Um, so how, how do we solve this? Is that, or, or is this just a generational change and I'm caught in between? See, when we travel at the airports and various bookshops, we come across new books, new authors, and then these authors become hit. But e-books, perhaps those authors will be lost. I, that, that's my fear. That's my fear. You know, unless the author himself does so much of marketing, or the publisher does so much of marketing. But you know, generally you don't see those books. Uh, in, in a, if you don't see them physical form, it could be that you know. On the contrary, aren't there more and more uh, uh, authors self, the, the medium itself allows for that self-published author? I mean, everyone is an author. My worry is a children's publisher, however um, snooty that sounds, is that everyone thinks they can write a children's book. And, um, you know, so the mother's father is that there is a difference. There is a difference. I mean, do it as a little scrapbook at home or a child writes a book that um, you know, is in the school magazine, it's different from putting it out there as a published book, there's a whole process that which all publishers here will agree, 
a very specialized process, and that is what makes that book what it is. And but on the other hand, this whole medium allows everyone to self publish, no, take short It class. does, it does. But then, how do you visually you don't see books on the stands. You know, you see books in, in, in your iPads, but then, you know, you don't see them while traveling. And I think that does make a difference. So I think there will be a whole section that sees it online, and then another who actually look yeah, for it in bookshops. And there will be a divide there about uh, yes, who will use yeah. what. It's time. Uh, actually, we've run out of time. This is, this is a kind of a conversation which will carry on forever. Um, do you think we have time for one more question? Just one last question. It's more of an observation to Pranesh's uh, comment. Yeah. The books, when a library buys it, after a few years, the binding comes off, and you have to buy a new book for it. In the case of ebook, that is not the case. And therefore, publishers would need to find ways in which they can still make some uh, revenue out of that IP. And that's why these yeah. new things are coming up. But the more important thing that I wanted to point out is what Radhika was saying, that clickability is not interactivity. And that is the one thing that seems to be missing in the conversations that you see happening in online forums about you know, how great e-books are going to be and how enhanced e-books can make uh, visual books come alive. But that is important to remember that for people who work with visual books such as we do and Radhika does, that when you go into the online medium, you really also need to start looking at what the medium can do and start designing it accordingly. And there are compulsions like discoverability of your book becomes very important in the online world. And that's something that Indian publishers would need to learn very soon if they want their books to be noticed. Thank you. I think this is a kind of conversation which we can carry on and on. I think one of the things we need to recognize is that the internet has brought about the democratization of knowledge and accessibility, etc., and publish the publishing industry as we know it today. And I mean globally and not just India, which is unique with its own set of characteristics, is undergoing a very severe test. And it is a test which we will which we will come through. But it is a challenging and an interesting one. And right now the internet is creating this churn where we think that uh, we don't know where digital books are. There is this frontier mentality uh, existing which says that anything goes, so uh, publishers are concerned about quality control, etc. Are we still going to be there? Publishers will always be there. Because as James has indicated, the, the moment there are mistakes, there's proofing errors, etc., that's the greatest damage. Publishers will be required. Publishers who are specialists, who are good at their job, and not specialists in terms of just digital technology. What the publishing industry has to actually recognize, realize is that the churn that we are going through today is what the music industry went through at least 10 years ago. And there are, um, to, uh, and they, they are still coming to terms with it. But one of the things, in fact, and, uh, this is Mr. Balani's comment that uh, you know, vinyl records, etc., are outdated. Actually, in the music industry, what they are doing is they are creating new package deals, where if you want to collect this edition of a vinyl record or something, you have the entire package deal of you know the iCloud download, etc., for free. But you buy that at a premium. So what publishers have to do is we have to concentrate on new business models, adapt to the new changing publishing ecosystem. Learn from examples, for God's sake, learn to be more accessible and communicate with each other and not be insular. And yes, be very clear about the, um, the business of it. Because it is, it is a misconception that e-books are cheap. They may, you know, people think that they should be priced at 99 cents, etc. They are difficult, they, 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 they require in, uh, the same amount of labor. As a, as a print book. But yes, what is different is that the internet and the ebook gives a person, gives anyone, the opportunity to self publish. And when you get that opportunity, it means that your income streams and your business models change. You no longer need, you don't necessarily need a publisher who will only give you a 10% or a 20% royalty. Amazon is different because they were pioneers and so they gave you 70%. But the point is that. You can be on. You can still earn. Anyways, there are a lot of lot of questions here, a lot of opportunities, but let's see where we go from here. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.
Thank you.